Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the October 29th professional VMware.com v. Brown Bag. Tonight we have Jeff Gerling on with us talking about Ansible. I am your host for the evening, Jonathan Frappier, and you can uh, chat with me on Twitter. That's not the right arrow button. There we go. You can chat with me on Twitter using the V Brown Bag hashtag or pop your questions into the GoToMeeting window if you have some for Jeff, and I will make sure they get to him. You can check out all of our podcasts. Currently, we are running uh, the APAC podcast every other Thursday. We've got our EMEA podcast that goes on Tuesday, which right now we're looking for some VMware NSX presenters. If anyone's out there and wants to take a dive in, we're up to objective five on that. We have our Latin America podcast also on Thursdays, and then, of course, our U.S. podcast here every Wednesday night where we are running our DevOps series through just about January right now. Uh, we may add some shows to the end of that as well. You can catch, uh, at this point, most of our podcasts on our regular, not up on iTunes yet, so bit.ly.com slash brownbagpodcast. We are starting to play catch up on our iTunes channel, so if you want to check those out there, bit.ly.com slash brownbag, or bit.ly slash brownbag iTunes, not bit.ly.com. And with that, oh, uh, Tech Talks in Paris at the OpenStack Summit. Uh, Alistair is going to be there. I believe uh, a few other folks are going to be there. So if you are going to be in Paris for the OpenStack Summit, uh, stop in and check out the Tech Talks that we got going on. And with that, Jeff, I am going to make you the presenter, and then you can uh, have at it. Thank you. All right. Let me make sure, uh, just let me make sure, can you see my screen? I can see you for sure. Okay, perfect. I have to apologize, about five minutes before we started, my computer just went belly up and I had to restart everything and get everything back up and running. So um, it should be good. Hopefully it doesn't lock up on me now. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Ansible, uh, and I wanted to give a little background before we begin. Um, I currently work at Acquia. It's a company that um, does some huge digital engagement projects using Drupal. Uh, it, based in Boston, I'm a technical architect there. You can find me pretty much anywhere uh, as Gearling Guy. Uh, ping me on Twitter if you need to, and I'll hopefully respond within a day or so. Uh, and as I say here, I'm a, I'm a developer by trade, and I do ops by necessity. And that's mostly because pretty much any uh, ops person will tell you you can develop as much as you want, but you're not going to have a running application unless you have it on a server somewhere. Uh, so for me, that means I, I started out in development and kind of got into ops because I wanted to make my development much better. Uh, and I did it at a great time because the dev, DevOps movement, kind of the melding of the two into making sure that we uh, kind of have communication channels between development and operations and more uh, flexibility in the solutions that we use to get our applications running on servers and on the internet. Uh, that was happening over the past few years when I started getting into it in a big way. Uh, and also I'm writing a book on Ansible, so that's part of my interest in Ansible is learning more about it to make sure I'm writing some good information. Uh, and you can find that book at ansible4devops.com. It's available on LeanPub. So. At the end of the presentation, I'll have some links as well, and I, I think in the uh, post afterwards. So uh, the problem that really brings us here today, and the, probably the reason why you're listening to this DevOps series, is that uh, a lot of times people have a situation kind of like this, uh, where sysadmins and developers and business uh, people tend to have conflict, and uh, a lot of sysadmins have trouble keeping up with demand, especially as systems become much more complex from one server to two servers to ten servers, now to hundreds or thousands of servers. Um, so you end up with developers and, and business uh, people kind of competing for sysadmins, and sysadmins get burnout. Not very good things that happen. Um, and also, uh, a principle that I think is becoming the norm now is that you should be able to rebuild servers uh, in less time than it takes for somebody to diagnose an issue, find what server it's happening on, log into that server, fix the server. If you know there's an error on a server, you should be able to rebuild that server 
and have it up and running uh, very quickly. And there are a lot of different ways that we can do this nowadays. And some of the main ones I've listed in this table, uh, we have Puppet and Chef, Salt and Ansible are the, kind of the four modern solutions that I see most of the time. There's also CF Engine and a few others uh, for configuration management. Uh, and I know that there's already been a session in this series on Puppet, and uh, <coughs> Puppet's kind of the, the oldest, what I would call, modern configuration management tool. It has a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, that you kind of have to know to be able to configure things. Uh, it uses a specialized template language, uh, same thing that Chef uses, basically. Uh, but it requires you, out of the box, to install an, a daemon on each of your servers that checks in and gets data and configuration uh, to be deployed. And there's other ways to do it, but out of the box, that's the way Puppet's built. Uh, it also doesn't have any kind of built-in mechanism for running single commands on servers or collecting data from servers quickly and easily. Uh, there are plugins to do these things, but this is basically out of the box and the, the way it's built. Uh, Chef is a lot, in a lot of ways similar to Puppet. So a lot of people that I know that do Chef, it's mostly because either it's the first uh, configuration management tool they used and it's a little newer than Puppet, or because it's a little more familiar to a Ruby developer, things like that. But in, uh, in my mind, they're, they're close to the same kind of solution. They, they target a lot of the same areas, and they're both great. Uh, Puppet has a lot of uh, momentum and, and has, been, has been very popular for years. Uh, Salt and Ansible are two newer solutions, I would say. Uh, Salt was founded in 2011, Ansible in 2012, and both of them have a lot of similarities. Uh, they both use YAML, which is a very human-readable syntax, uh, the, and YAML stands for yet another markup language. The point of it was really to make a configuration language that was actually easy, easy to be read by humans and written by humans. Uh, so you'll see an example of that in a minute. But instead of having to learn a, a special kind of syntax, YAML is used all over the place for configuration. And what better uh, syntax to use for configuration management than a configuration language? Uh, and also it uses Jinja2 for the template language, uh, which is a pretty simple but flexible and powerful way to, uh, to build templates for configuration and uh, like Apache and all that. Um, but one thing that differentiates Ansible from Salt is that it's agentless by default. You don't have to install anything on your servers to be able to use Ansible, get up and running with it. Uh, Ansible works over SSH, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a little bit. But uh, basically, you can install Ansible on your workstation, and if you can access a server through SSH or through, uh, through Windows, through PowerShell, then you're able to control it without having to install anything on that remote server. Uh, it uses Python, which is installed on pretty much every server I've ever seen. Uh, I'm younger, so I have not been around uh, in the 80s and early 90s too much in the server space. So I, every server that I've ever used has had Python running on it. Uh, so, and it also, uh, both of them support executing tasks on remote hosts uh, using what's called ad hoc mode. Um, you can you can basically run a command on one or all your hosts or groups of hosts. Uh, and that's extremely handy, especially in cases where you need to hotfix something or where you need to reboot a service on all your servers immediately, uh, something like that. Um, and also I have the stats down there of all the GitHub stars. This is not a huge influential uh, part of the uh, matrix, but it is interesting to see how, how much the uptake of Ansible has been. And I think that's in a large part due to its simplicity. You can get up and running with Ansible in literally an hour, maybe two. Um, and then you can have an entire infrastructure described in configuration in a day and have it be item potent and, and working very well. Now, I say all that, but I also would say, um, as part of this series, I'm, you're going to see an overview of, of Puppet and Ansible and Salt and CF Engine and all these other tools. Uh, in the Ansible community, we kind of coined the term hug ops, meaning we're all in this together. And for a lot of people, that you don't use any kind of configuration management at this point. Anything is better than nothing. And uh, I think if you start learning Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible, CF Engine, whatever it is, uh, that's going to be a lot better than a shell script or manual steps uh, or using images and passing them around, that kind of thing. So we're all in it together. We're all making uh, the operations world better. 
and that is why we are here. Uh, so a little more on Ansible. The philosophy of Ansible, if you go to the website, it's easy, secure, fast, and complete, basically meaning uh, you want it to be easy to pick up for anyone who does uh, system management, uh, but you also want to make it fast so that they're not you know, waiting around for things to, to finish and uh, they're not disappointed in their choice because some of the other tools, Salt especially, has a lot of, uh, it has in the past historically had a lot of focus on speed of deployments. Uh, you also want it to be secure and Ansible uses SSH which is extremely robust, has been used for years, and is uh, highly secure. And it also is complete, uh, and that goes along with the third bullet point down here, that uh, Ansible has a batteries included philosophy, meaning instead of having to install a bunch of plugins and configure a bunch of things to configure configuration management, everything is included out of the box with an install. Um, and another thing that I like about Ansible uh, especially as we move into a world where you're deploying containers for applications and, and using Docker and LXC and things like that, Ansible doesn't just do configuration management. It just so happens to, in my opinion, be the, the easiest and best configuration management tool, uh, but it also does things like provision servers, uh, manage containers, and uh, run ad hoc commands, that kind of stuff. Uh, and also Ansible can manage Linux, OS X, Windows, and, and uh, Unix-like systems. Uh, Windows, I have an asterisk there because you can't run Ansible on Windows natively. Uh, there are ways to work around that, uh, but you can manage Windows hosts. That's a new feature in Ansible 1.7. Uh, and today, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into that, uh, but most of the things that apply to managing Linux uh, machines applies the same to Windows. Um, and also, as we get into this too, please ask questions. Um, you know, it, we'll we'll have plenty of time for that, I think. And I, I really like that part of this presentation because uh, usually I can't think of a tenth of the things that people really want to hear about. So, ask the questions. We'll get to them, and we'll we'll talk about uh, all the things you're interested in. Um, and this is the saying for Ansible that's on the GitHub page. Uh, Ansible, this is kind of a, a deeper summary of the fast, secure, uh, and complete. It's automate in a language that approaches plain English, that's YAML, uh, using SSH, a very secure and widely used protocol, with no agents to install on remote systems, and that makes it simple and easy. Uh, and just to give a quick overview, uh, although you know, with any of these tools you're going to find huge companies and big organizations using it, uh, but Ansible does have a lot of uh, uptake in high-end, many, many server uh, deployments. And I'm also using it, of course, for some of my services and for my book. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to feel bad using Ansible and feel like no one else is using it. Twitter, NASA, a lot of other companies are using it. So that was kind of a brief overview of Ansible. Um, and. I, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not. I am not affiliated with Ansible Incorporated in any way whatsoever. I have an Ansible T-shirt and I think a sticker on my laptop, but that's about it. Um, I'm writing this book, so I have a little skin in the game, I guess. But uh, you know, I I don't want to give any kind of sales pitch. I just think it's a great tool. I've had a lot of success with it. Uh, pretty much everybody I've ever worked with that has uh, started using Ansible has also had the same opinion. So I just want to show off kind of the simplicity and how it works, and uh, we'll go from there. So we're going to go over a few uh, parts of Ansible. Inventory, uh, which is how you describe to Ansible your servers and infrastructure. Ad hoc tasks, uh, which are basically running tasks on remote servers uh, through your command line locally. Uh, playbooks, which are Ansible's kind of packaged way of setting something up, so telling it, uh, here's the different steps you need to do to set this server up or to deploy an application, that kind of thing. We're going to go over Ansible Tower briefly. Uh, that's, that's a product from Ansible Incorporated that lets you uh, manage infrastructure uh, with your team. It gives you a dashboard, a user interface, uh, kind of, and also integrates with LDAP and other things so that you can have the business, have the developers, have the operations staff all manage the respective parts of infrastructure that they need to and have thorough reporting. Uh, and also we'll cover other things too if we have time. Uh, and uh, 
I, I have to apologize too. I actually have mostly worked with uh, infrastructure through Amazon Web Services, through Linode, through DigitalOcean, and some other providers. I haven't had as much experience with VMware and vSphere and things like that. So I know that some people are interested in learning more about how Ansible works with them. And I have an example uh, for that, but I, I probably wouldn't be the best person to answer all the questions you have about that. Uh, at least not yet. I haven't gotten to that part in the book yet. So let's, let's get started. Um, this is a really simple example of an inventory. So this might be a super simple infrastructure with a varnish reverse proxy, a couple web servers that that proxy is in front of, and then a couple database servers, maybe a master and a slave. Um, this is as simple as inventory is. You just tell Ansible, here's a group. So we have a group that's varnish. All the varnish servers would be under it. And here's our servers, and in this case, just one. Here's a group, the www servers. You could call it web servers, whatever you want. And here's the servers in it. Uh, same thing with DB is the group for the database servers. And uh, I don't have time to explain or explore fully the different ways you can use inventory effectively or uh, things like dynamic inventory, but there's a lot of flexibility in the model that Ansible uses. You can have uh, groups of groups. You can have uh, variables per group. You can set variables per host in different ways. You can use dynamic inventory to uh, update the inventory based on infrastructure in, in uh, vSphere or in Amazon Web Services or different places so that you don't have to manually have uh, this com compiled list somewhere. But normally this file, this inventory file, would live in Etsy slash Ansible slash hosts. So it follows kind of the, the Unix convention of throwing it in Etsy and it's a host file or an inventory file. You can put it in different places, but that's generally where you keep it. Uh, and then the next step, uh, I already have this inventory set up on my computer, so I'm not going to have to set that up again. But I'll show you how ad hoc commands work, or ad hoc. I never know how to pronounce that. Um, so this first command is uh, usually when you use your inventory to set things up, you'd want to use this command just to make sure that you're seeing all your hosts. So in my case, uh, let's see, uh, I need to make sure that the hosts are up. Like I said, my computer just kind of blew up before I started this, so hopefully it brings up all the machines correctly. Um, so I'm going to say ansible all ping, and dash m is module, so we're just going to use ansible simple ping module. And you can see actually it's pinging all of my hosts. I need to... I need to go to Dropbox, uh, let's see, where is it, testing, okay, and I'm, I have a separate inventory file in here, let me show you. So in here I have this inventory file, and if I show it to you, uh, you can see it has, it has varnish www.db. Uh, those servers in it, and then I have some variables defined below. So if I say Ansible, uh, okay, so if I say Ansible, uh, all ping, and specify that inventory file, then it will try pinging all my machines, and you can see it's it's hitting them successfully. And again, I apologize with that uh, complete wipeout. It kind of took away my terminal session and everything. So you can see a couple of the servers aren't up right now, so it's not connecting. But as long as you can SSH into the server uh, using uh, any key, uh, that's usually the best way. You can also use a password if you need to. It's generally preferred to use keys. Um, anyway, so that's Ansible ping and that's going to be annoying. Let me continue bringing them up. And then you can also do things like uh, use Ansible's service module. You could run a command like service HTTP uh, start if you wanted, but you can also use Ansible service module, which will give you a little more flexibility in error detection and reporting. Um, so we'll do that. Let me say Ansible, and I'll just do it on the www hosts that we defined above. Uh, service, and then is it uh, HTTP? Oops. C 
So if I go here, it's probably going to give me an error because we haven't actually provisioned this yet. Which it, that would be expected. Okay, yeah, so it can't find uh, service. And uh, I haven't set up the, the servers yet. We're going to do that a little bit later. But you can do things like that. Uh, you can do things like add a database on a database server. There's a module built in for MySQL. There's a module built in for uh, Postgres and for some other systems, Redis and such. Uh, so you can set things up through Ansible's modules. Uh, and I mean, technically speaking, you could use ad hoc to uh, set up your entire server, but that would not be very flexible. Uh, because you'd still have a manual process of doing that. So Ansible has playbooks, which basically encapsulate all of these commands uh, in a list of tasks. So this is a simple playbook that would, uh, first it would be on all your hosts. You'd tell it which hosts, which group in your inventory to use. Uh, you could use www, and this would only run on those hosts. Then you give it a list of tasks. And in this, in this particular playbook, which actually would run if you had these files in place, uh, at first, it's going to run a script, a shell script, so you can run that shell script, or uh, you can use the command module to run a command, uh, different things like that. Uh, then it's going to set up a cron job checkers uh, to check what directories are in the folder that cron is running in, and it would do that uh, on the second hour of every day. So you can set cron jobs pretty easily with a simple syntax that's, in my opinion, a little more easy to remember than, than the actual cron tab syntax. Uh, you can do things like notify uh, different people or, or channels in chat. So this is an IRC notification. You can notify, send a message to a certain channel. Uh, this is nice for if you're, if you're doing certain things that might fail or might not, like running a test suite in an application or something like that, you can have it notify if the test fails. Uh, or passes, um, stick a notification in your Jabber channel, Slack, or IRC, wherever you are, uh, or send out an email, or even if you're running it on your local Mac, you can use OSX Say and have it speak uh, to you after it finishes running. So if you have a playbook that takes 20 minutes and you background it, uh, you can still hear it say that the deployment's finished or something along those lines. So that's a pretty simple playbook. I'm going to walk you through a, an example of a more complicated playbook that would actually set up a real server. Um, and we'll do that on a little demonstration infrastructure that I've set up. This kind of mirrors uh, the basic infrastructure for a small to medium-sized high-traffic website. Uh, you might have a couple application servers with a reverse proxy running in front of it to cache the pages. Uh, this also acts like a load balancer. You could use HAProxy or something in front of this, even if you wanted to. Uh, and then there's a memcache server to store sessions and, and other transient data that is a little faster than a database. And then at the end, we have a database that's holding, uh, holding the, the storage for the web application. And any of these parts are interchangeable. You know, it doesn't have to be Apache. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but this is the infrastructure I picked to set up here. And last night, I decided that I would do that, and I wrote this up in about an hour, so it should work. But hopefully, let's see if these servers ever came up. There might still be one that, yeah, Varnish needs to come up still. So we'll wait just a second for that. And... If that ever comes up, I will show you, since that's still coming up, I'll switch over here. So this, this main.yaml is the playbook I'm going to run uh, once this all comes up. And the playbook is basically including a few other playbooks. So we have a playbook that sets up Varnish, a playbook that sets up Apache on both of the two servers, a playbook that sets up the database, and a playbook that sets up the memcache server. And that's still connecting. And so each one of these, I'll, I'll uh, pop over to the database one since that one's a little simpler. Uh, this is the playbook for it. So just like in the example earlier, we just tell it, here's our host database. Uh, I want it to use sudo for these tasks since pretty much everything's going to require it. Uh, I'm logging in as the vagrant user, which requires sudo to, to configure things. Uh, and then it gives a list of tasks. So in this example, I give it a name. That way, when I'm running the playbook, it, it tells me what it's doing instead of just saying installing these packages. Uh, and then I'm going to tell it to install a list of packages. 
and this is uh, using uh, Jinja 2 syntax. These little double handlebars basically let you insert a variable inside your parameters. So we're giving it a few packages that we want it installed. And then after that, we're going to use Ansible service module to make sure that the MySQL server is running and also enabled at system start, so you don't have to uh, use check config or anything like that uh, and check output. All these different commands that Ansible is going to run, it'll run the command and then it'll check the uh, status, the result of it, give you uh, a red if it failed, a green if it passed, and orange if it uh, changed something. So I think that now if I save Egren up, it should have all the servers up. Okay, so they're finally running, and uh, you can see here's the, the main.yaml file here, uh, which is going to include these different playbooks, and if everything is as I had it before my computer crashed, it should work. Uh, Ansible playbook is the command to run a playbook, and I'll give it main.yaml, and then I pass the inventory file that I generated for this. And it's going to start running through. And these VMs are all fresh. I just, there's nothing on them. It's just CentOS 6.5, I think, is running on them. So uh, it's going to run through that. And actually, while this is happening, you can see it's giving uh, yellow for changes, and it'll give green for uh, things that are OK. They haven't changed. Um, in this case, most of it's going to be changes. And it'll give it red for a failure. Hopefully, we don't have any of those. But it looks like it's running fine. Uh, but at this point, while this is running, do we have any questions? Uh, where's my go-to? All quiet on the question front so far. OK, sounds good. This should only take a minute or two. Of course, I say that, and then my 100 megabit internet will probably go down to like 1 megabit or something. No worries. So I, I, yeah. so I set up this, uh, this host name, varnish.dev, is the Varnish server that's sitting in front of the Apache servers. And those two are at, uh, oh, you can see this one's already coming up, uh, 192.168.2.3 and .2.4. And that one seems to be up now, too. So if those are up and Varnish is up, then this page May or may not. No, it's not. So it's still copying over some stuff. Oh, it's installing PHP. And then it'll copy over a little uh, PHP file that's going to connect to MySQL, connect to uh, connect to memcache, and make sure they're working. And I also set things up. Obviously, this is not going to be my production. I'm not running server check-in on this playbook right here. Uh, there's some more things that you want to do, security hardening and things like that. Uh, but this is, it's going to set everything up to the point where it's working, um, and it also sets up Varnish, uh, if you know uh, how Varnish works, it's actually setting it up, wrong file, the VCL, it's setting it up to not cache anything. Uh, so this would probably not be how you want to run Varnish in production, because it would be useless to have Varnish running. But this is kind of turning off Varnish's caching layer and using it as a, uh, as a dumb uh, load balancer instead. It's just directing random requests to either server. So if I pop back in here now, so it's it looks like MySQL's already up and running. So here's uh, one uh, 2.4 is the second server, and if I keep refreshing, since the caching is turned off, it's actually giving me to one or the, one server or the other randomly. So you can see I'm refreshing and it changes, and uh, it looks like if I refresh fast enough, I can get a memcache fail which must mean that the, the memcache server is not tuned as well as I could. Uh, but to prove that this isn't all just smoke and mirrors, I will log in to, oh, it's, uh, is it MySQL? DB. So I'll log into the database server. Oh, it's in the wrong, hold on. Uh, So I'll log into the database server. So if I stop MySQL, then MySQL's down. So it's not just smoke and mirrors. And if I start it back up, then it's back. So and of course it was silly of me to log in because I could have just said, uh, let me make sure I'm in the right directory. Uh, db 
inventory. Um, uh, what was status? No, service. So I could do this without having to log into the server, and Ansible will do it for me. And apparently, stopping my SQL failed. <laughs> so, as we all know, demos are never beautiful things. So my SQL's still up. Oh, I, I forgot to use sudo. So we passed dash to s to run it as sudo. And now it should turn off. There it is. So using Ansible instead of logging into the server, uh, which can be very powerful because if I had 300 servers to run, uh, I don't want to have 300 terminal windows or have some sort of uh, other extra application installed and have to manage the inventory through there as well. So with Ansible, like for instance, if I wanted to turn off Apache on both of the Apache servers, uh, let me give myself some room. So if I say Ansible, www uh, inventory, and then I say dash s, uh, dash m, service, dash a, If I want to stop Apache on all the servers, it just did it on both. And Ansible does this asynchronously, uh, and you can set how many uh, how many it will do at once at the same time. Right now, I think I have mine set using the forks parameter of Ansible to run nine tasks at a time on nine different servers. So when I run this, if I had 20 servers, it should only take a few seconds to run it on all 20. Um, you can imagine how long it would take if you were doing it by hand. Um, and also, like I said, one of the nicest things is I already have this inventory described for my configuration. I can use it immediately with Ansible without having to install another tool or have a separate uh, server management system kind of running to, to keep an inventory of all my servers. So I'm going to bring that back up. I'll verify that's down. Uh, it says it stopped. That's interesting. Well, we'll just say that it's actually running. Uh, oh, because I was not, I was not sudo. Again. Okay, so now it's not working. There we go. And Varnish is angry too. So I'll bring it back up. And we'll pop over to those playbooks and I'll show you how this is all running. Uh, oh, and, and I'll just run it again really quick. This will only take a second because it's all configured. Uh, one nice thing that I like about Ansible is you can run this again, and the uh, if there are no changes, it'll give you a nice little report at the end, and the exit code will be zero. So you can script this or run it through Jenkins or something like that uh, to just make sure that your infrastructure is in the correct state. And it looks like there actually was a change. So I guess I must have had my SQL stop still. And it should have started it now. So if I run it again, it should give me zero changes. And if you have a lot more servers, it's still going to be close to this fast unless you have a lot of network latency uh, or if one of your servers is having trouble or something like that. But now you can see uh, there were no changes. Everything is OK. So uh, for me, it, the nice thing is this gives me instant uh, insight into are any of my servers out of the configuration that I started them in. And um, and for me, some of my servers I have running through Jenkins continuously so that if there's ever a server that does go out of uh, the state that I configured it in, I'll get an email immediately, uh, probably within 10 minutes or so, telling me one of the servers was out of the right state and uh, it was corrected through the, the Jenkins run. Um, and Ansible also has Tower for that. We'll look at that in a couple minutes. So let me show you these playbooks. So uh, which one do we want to start with? We'll, we'll start from the top. I'll pop over to Varnish. And uh, here we're running it on all the Varnish hosts that are defined in our inventory file. So that's just one. That's our Varnish group. And this can be an IP address, IP version 6, or uh, DNS name, whatever you want. Uh, and then it gives, it, we're going to run it as sudo because it's going to need to have privileges to install things. So first it's going to add a repository. There's actually an Ansible module for adding repositories. Uh, I don't know why I didn't use it here, but I think that I was just, uh, I think I was 
just brain fart at that moment. So uh, next thing it's going to do is install Varnish once it has that repository set up uh, using yum. That's pretty simple. Uh, state could be state installed, uh, removed, uh, or latest. Latest will mean that every time this is run, it'll check for the latest version. Uh, if it's just installed, it'll just make sure it's installed and pass along. Uh, so that's nice to pin a certain version if you need to. Uh, and then it's going to use the copy module, which is simple and flexible, uh, to copy an item from a source to a destination on the server. The source is local on this machine, and the destination is somewhere on the server. So I have a uh, default VCL file for Varnish and the Varnish configuration. Uh, those two files are going to be copied up to the server. And then there's something interesting here, notify. And that means that whenever this task results in a change, it will take this notification handler, restart Varnish, and it will run that at the end of the playbook. Uh, and that's a handler. So if you change a configuration file or something, the next time you run the playbook, if that configuration ch file changes, you want to make sure that you restart the service so that it picks up those changes. Uh, so you use a notify handler. Uh, and that's pretty simple, too. It's using the service module to restart Varnish. Uh, and then finally, I'm using that uh, the same command we saw in the database earlier, uh, using service to say, make sure that the Varnish service is started uh, when we run the script and also enabled at system boot. Uh, so that's Varnish. It's fairly simple. We're adding a repo, installing it, copying some config, and booting the service, uh, or restarting it if we change some configuration. Uh, next, we'll take a quick look at www. This is to install Apache. So for some of the PHP packages, I needed Apple for, uh, for CentOS. Um, if you're using uh, Ubuntu, I don't think you need to have any extra, any extra PPOs or anything for it. But on this playbook, uh, I used Apple. So that's, that's the simpler way of adding a repo using the UM module. Uh, and then I installed Apache. And then I installed PHP, and for uh, Red Hat and CentOS and Fedora, you can enable a repository using enable repo. Uh, so I used Apple to install, I think it was PHP Peckle Memcached was the one that required that repository. And um, again, there's another handler here. So when I install PHP, or if I change the list of packages or something, in order to pick that up, the way that this server is configured, I need to restart Apache. Uh, so I have a handler down here to do that for me. And then I call it whenever we change the, the packages that are installed with PHP. And then finally, uh, I copy over this little uh, PHP index page that generates the, uh, the host name and tests the MySQL and memcache connections through PHP. Uh, so that's the Apache installation. And the database, we ran through it. I'll show it to you again. This one is the simplest, at least the installation part of it. Um, now, uh, you might be wondering how, uh, how you would run things like the uh, MySQL secure installation script that you're supposed to do after you install MySQL. Well, it's pretty simple to use uh, Ansible's built-in functionality to, to do the same things in that script, but automated and with item potency, so when you run it again in the future, it won't break anything. So Ansible has a MySQL user module that you can use to configure users, or in this case, make sure that the root passwords are updated. Um, this is highly insecure. Do not use this ever in production playbooks or even development playbooks. Use your own root password, um, but this is for an example. And uh, then it uses a template. It copies over a .my.cnf file that lets Ansible in the future manage uh, MySQL without having to uh, specify passwords through here. Um, and also for copy and template and any other file handling modules, uh, earlier you saw source and destination, but you can also set things like owner, uh, group, and the file mode. Um, this is a hex number, uh, so you know a lot of files would be 644 or 755, whatever they need to be. Um, and let's see, so there's MySQL user, MySQL DB, I mentioned those things. Uh, but this, this file here basically does everything that my, MySQL secure installation does, because uh, it's a lot harder to script that. If you've ever had to write a shell script to wrap the MySQL installation and run everything, you probably are using expect and other things. Not very fun. 
So anyway, uh, that's how we install MySQL. And then memcached is another pretty simple one. You literally install it and make sure it's running. And then it will sit there and listen for requests and store cache data. Uh, so that's that infrastructure. And the reason I run through all that is because I want to highlight how I think, let's see, there were like four, somewhere between four to 30 lines of YAML, which is all human readable. Uh, you know, you just give it a name. I don't even have to have name. You could just use this if you like having one line for each configuration item. Uh, but the name gives us this kind of documentation while we're running it. Uh, you can configure an entire infrastructure without much syntax. It's, it's really simple to see what things are doing and how it's working. You can also add uh, variables by saying vars. Um, and you can say, for instance, uh, Apache package. And then we can take this variable and toss it in here uh, using the handlebar syntax again. That's from Jinja2, a way to define a variable, to print a variable in here. And the reason why I show you this is because uh, one other thing that's pretty easy to do with Ansible is to make these playbooks cross-platform, cross-distribution. Uh, I will hopefully have a couple minutes to talk about um, Ansible Galaxy and Ansible roles, but uh, the roles that I have made and shared with the community all of them I strive to make at least work on Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Red Hat, Fedora, and CentOS, since those are kind of the most popular distributions that I've seen for server use. And um, you can do that by using a variable like Apache package, because on Ubuntu it's, and uh, Debian it's Apache 2 for Apache 2 and 2.4. But on Red Hat and Fedora and uh, CentOS, it's HTDD. So, um, other things like that, you, you can do that, and you can also include a variables file uh, particular to a certain distribution, things like that, and unfortunately I don't have time to talk about that today, but that's why I have a book, uh, so you can get to that. Um, so uh, I'm going to pop back over here. Hey, Jeff. Have a nice little demo. Yeah. Does, uh, does Ansible do what, have any logging so you can see the status of the uh, playbooks or commands you've run later on, just not inside the terminal? Yes, yes. And there's actually a few different ways to approach that. And uh, it looks like we're, we're at about 45 minutes. So um, I'll try to summarize this relatively quickly so we have a little more time for any questions or discussion. Uh, Ansible has a product called Tower, which is a web UI that's built purpose-built just for Ansible and works really, really well. Um, you can have users that are parts of organizations uh, and teams that are in organizations that manage different aspects, like some people could deploy to uh, QA servers, other people can deploy to production, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, you can manage your inventories through this UI, and it gives you introspection into literally every part of a, a playbook run. So you can see here, uh, this is what I'm using for uh, server check-in a uh, server checking service that I'm running. And this is a playbook that uh, sets up all the check servers that, that run checks. And um, you can see the last run that I had, there were eight successful hosts, none failed. That's a wonderful thing. I hate it when one of them fails. But you can see there was a failure at some point, 1029. And uh, it gives you a log of the different runs when they happened. Uh, you can go in and see the standard output from it. Uh, actually, it's logged me out, so let me log back in. So you can see that it, it logs the uh, actual output as well as, if I go back to the job, it gives you summaries of everything that's happened. Now you can see that one of the servers, there was uh, one task that changed. That means this server somehow got out of the configuration that I had set up. Uh, so, you know, things like that I might want to look into later. It gives you a list of all the different tasks that it did. And it gives you nice graphs and summaries that uh, are all very easy to digest and, and make it even simpler to see kind of what's going on. Uh, and Ansible Tower is one of a few different ways that you can do kind of team-based uh, auditable playbook management. Uh, some people also use things like Jenkins or, or uh, Go, not the language, the config or the uh, continuous integration Go. 
and they you can run playbooks through them as well and make sure that your servers are uh, all in in order as well so I don't have a demo set up for that but that's actually what I'm using for some of my other infrastructure I simply have a Jenkins server that has Ansible installed on it and every hour uh, it runs the playbook and uh, checks the if there were any changes and if there's a change it'll shoot me an email uh, so the other nice thing that that enables is once I've finished something I can send it up to my repository Jenkins or Tower will download that uh, repository and automatically run it on some test infrastructure and it'll test everything all my infrastructure changes and uh, it also runs all my application test suites my automated tests so that I know uh, very quickly if something I'm doing in development or an infrastructure change will break things uh, and then once that's all finished I can pop in here and I can run the playbook by hand on the production infrastructure uh, it can also automate the production infrastructure if you want, but I have not uh, gone that far. So hopefully that answers that pretty well. Um, I also wanted to show just really quick, uh, since as I said earlier, I, I have not been very involved in the, uh, the uh, VMware realm lately. Uh, there's a module for, built into Ansible, vSphere Guest, and there's a lot of people using uh, vSphere and VMware and Rackspace and Amazon and all the other kinds of cloud systems that you can think of, OpenStack, uh, and you can provision servers within Ansible. So a cool thing that that enables is, uh, so this is kind of a sample that's actually cut off. It goes down, uh, continues on. Um, you can set every parameter that you want to build your new server. So what that enables here is if I wanted to, I could also say uh, vSphere guest, and then I could define my server here, and then I could set that server up, and then these tasks could be run on that server, and what that enables is this playbook could literally describe and provision your entire infrastructure. So in the future, if you run it again, and let's say catastrophe happens when one of your servers was deleted by somebody who logged in and accidentally hit the delete button. Uh, you can just run this playbook again. That server will be reprovisioned and reconfigured uh, and you'll be back up and running. And, and also uh, as containers become more popular, uh, Docker and LXC and other systems, uh, you can also set those containers back up inside of your VMs or your servers uh, through Ansible in the same kind of fashion. Uh, so right now, most of my playbooks, I actually don't do the provisioning because I use a variety of cloud services. Uh, but for a couple of my sites, I actually do have the servers provisioning and the configuration all in one main playbook that includes the other playbooks that I need. And that's uh, a pretty slick solution because uh, there was a case where one of my VMs in DigitalOcean, which DigitalOcean has is great pricing but kind of spotty spotty servers sometimes I would say uh, it one time I had a server that for like two or three days was having flaky service it would go in and out every five to ten minutes so I simply deleted that server and um, and then ran my playbook and that server popped back up in about three minutes so and I think with containers becoming more popular we could do something like that in in seconds rather than minutes uh, so obviously if you have uh, better failover coverage and things like that, that would be a non-issue anyways. But for that particular service, I only had a database and web server, and the web server was failing. So um, that, that service didn't warrant a uh, high availability kind of infrastructure. Uh, so the other thing I was going to cover really quickly, uh, since we have a couple minutes, is Ansible Galaxy. So Ansible Galaxy is kind of a repository of roles, and roles are ways, so instead of like in this, uh, in our www example, uh, oops. so we have things like install the repo, install Apache, configure Apache, all that kind of stuff. We'd probably want to split out PHP uh, for maintainability, have that installed separately, and also make the configuration, uh, so you know our, our application, what's installed where, and also the Apache configuration. We want to break those things out so that we have shorter playbooks because it's a lot easier to see what's going on if you see something like this than if you see something like this. 
uh, where you have to scroll through it and kind of know what's going on. So you can include files and put variables into a variables file and uh, put handlers into their own file. When you get more advanced uh, chunks of configuration, you want to start splitting things out. And you can package that all up into an Ansible role, which then instead of, uh, instead of installing Apache like this, you can say, So you can say something like that, and this, this will uh, use the Apache role that I've uh, contributed back to Ansible Galaxy to install and configure Apache, and you can set variables using that role, like uh, uh, the, the, HT, or the Apache daemon and things like that. Um, and you'd say it's HTTPD. That kind of stuff is automatically set up for uh, that particular role, but you can override variables and roles pretty easily. And instead of having a bunch of huge playbooks, you literally just tell it what kind of things you want installed on your infrastructure. Uh, and so, uh, and as a quick demo of that, so if you look at Ansible Galaxy, there's roles to install pretty much any package I've seen. Um, and I have, I think, about 50 roles on there. I'm not quite the top user, although I was for a time. So I'm slightly jealous, but it's okay because the community is more important than me. Uh, so it's not even, oh, that's ratings. I'm going to see users. Here we go. So I think I'm number two now. So I'm going to have to add more roles to become number one again. But, uh, but these different roles enable you to do some pretty cool things. So if I go to GitHub, uh, and then I'll go to my uh, uh, repository full of examples using Vagrant to quickly spin up different things. So Let's say you want to have an Elk server. Uh, using some community contributed roles, uh, this is literally the entire uh, setup for installing Elk, the Elk stack for logging, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. So it just uses these roles and a little bit of configuration in variables. So let's see. So these are the variables that it sets uh, to set all that up. And you have an Elk stack running. Uh, and same thing for Let's say you want to have an Apache Solar server. So that is literally uh, just five different roles that it installs. And you set a few variables for your particular situation, like what port you want it to be running on. Uh, you set up some firewall stuff um, and your host name, things like that. So these are, uh, these are some examples. And I link to these in my book as well. Uh, this Ansible Vagrant Examples repository has some examples of how easy and quick it is. Like, if you just want to experiment with something, uh, you can just use a few roles that are contributed uh, or build your own roles and either contribute them or not. You don't have to. Um, and build different combinations of things. If you build your roles flexibly uh, so that they run well in a variety of situations, then it's really powerful what you can do through Ansible. Um, and I know that other configuration management systems have similar systems like Puppet modules, there's a central repository, things like that. So it's, it's, this is not exclusive to Ansible, but Ansible has done a really good job of, of making it an easy process to kind of uh, lump together related configuration, put it out there in a way that can be shared. Um, and, and the great thing is like my Apache role, I use it for a lot of different scenarios. Uh, for for HTTPS and and uh, unencrypted and for little servers that serve up uh, files like kind of an FTP internal server, different things like that. You can use one role to do all that different stuff. You don't have to set up a shell script ten different ways and have tons of spaghetti logic in it. Um, and all these different roles are out there. Uh, if you go to Galaxy, uh, all these different roles. Uh, so if I go to and go to web and actually let's just go to me because I know that I have my roles out here. So if I go to Apache, um, you can see there's ratings for the role, uh, there's a kind of a history of the versions, what platforms the role will run on. A lot of them will only run on one or two, but I always try to target the main uh, platforms. And then it gives you kind of description of that role and you can install it using the Ansible Galaxy command. So a lot of these things too, there's, there's a lot that I have not touched at all, uh, and the book explores it much more in depth. And I have to say also, 
um, you know, my book is my book is as good as I can make it, but really the Ansible docs are incredible. Like there's there's so many uh, different um, software products out there that I've I've read through the docs, and I I usually try to read at least the introductory parts of documentation to get a feel for it. And usually you feel kind of dumbfounded and and left in the dust uh, when you're picking up a new technology. But the Ansible docs have been incredibly thorough and well written and concise which is lacking in a lot of open source projects. Ansible is is open source, the actual uh, Ansible uh, software itself. Tower is not. Tower is part of Ansible Inc's software package but uh, Ansible is open source. You can run it in any way that you want and the documentation is all out there open source. You can contribute back to it but uh, really that that is the main and primary uh, way that you can start learning about Ansible quickly. Ansible for DevOps goes into a lot more detail in a few areas and I'm also trying to make it so that I can kind of help you with your struggles uh, in whatever kind of thing you're doing in your infrastructure. Um, and also here's a link to the uh, Ansible Vagrant examples that I was just showing you uh, kind of to give you a, a taste of, of different ways you can quickly get up and running with Ansible. Um, and I think that's that's all that I had in my notes here, but we can get into whatever you'd like to talk to. I don't know how much time we have left too, but uh, well, we've uh, rolled in nicely to the one hour time mark. Does anyone have any questions that's on with the slide? You can uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask Jeff a question uh, or you can pop it into the question or uh, chat window. Nothing so far. All right. Yeah, and and like I said too, um, I'm Gearling guy on Twitter and on GitHub and on pretty much anywhere. So if you ever have a question, please let me know. Um, Ansible has a very very active uh, community on IRC. Usually over 800 people in there at any given moment. So if you ever have any beginner questions or anything strange and, and oddball that you don't think anybody's ever encountered before, ask it in there, and I'm pretty sure you'll get a response. Um, it's pretty rare that somebody asks something and nobody responds to them in there, and it's a pretty friendly atmosphere. So, yes. Uh, one question that came up, uh, what network? Uh, IRC, what free node. Oh, uh, for oh, for Ansible. Yeah, yeah, that's on IRC on Freenode.net. Yeah, it's uh, pound sign Ansible is the channel, and um, I think there might be another channel or two like Ansible Dev or something for actual software development on the stack. Uh, but for general Ansible discussion, it's in there, and there have been some great discussions there. There's also a mailing list on uh, Google, uh, and that mailing list is pretty active as well. Uh, there's usually deeper discussions, things that obviously are not that well suited to chat. Somebody could ask something a little more advanced or taking a little more time to explain it. I know I had a fun discussion about uh, semantics or uh, syntax, and it uh, it may have been a little pedantic, but you know, I, like I said, I'm a developer by nature, and syntax is one of those things that we fight religious wars over. I was happy to hear somebody else take a take a shot at some open source documentation as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've I've been involved in three or four communities pretty deeply, and Ansible by far has the best documentation, and it's actually better than most closed source products that I've used in terms of how coherent it is. Like most of the time, you can tell that 25 different people are writing something. But with this, it, it seems like I wrote it, you know, mm -hmm. not to be bragging or something, but it, it just feels easy to read, easy to process, easy to walk through. And a lot of times, you know, if you have a question, you just Google it, and the Ansible docs have the answer right there for you. Yes. And they have a lot of great examples, too. Definitely. Well, I think that's it on the questions. Twitter's quiet, and the GoToMeeting chat window's quiet, so I think that's going to wrap us up for tonight. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. This was extremely uh, fun to prepare and present, and I hope that it has enlightened some people. Yes, thank you and very please, much. Please buy my book. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jeff. You're quite welcome. Have a good night, everyone.